China's Belt and Road Initiative often conjures up mental images of railways, roads, ports, heavy infrastructure used to transport goods and people. But there are many subsets of the BRI, including what's known as the Digital Silk Road. That's a project that emphasizes digital infrastructure, including 5G, fiber optic cables, e-commerce, and AI technology, including digital surveillance and censorship tech that is already in frequent use in China. I'm Shannon Tiazzi, Editor-in-Chief at The Diplomat, and this is Behind the News. I'm joined today by Michael Castor, who is the Asia Digital Program Manager at Article 19, and he's the lead author of a recent report on the Digital Silk Road and digital repression in the Indo-Pacific. Michael, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Shannon. Pleasure to be here. So we'll start out with the basics. Um, how would you describe the Digital Silk Road, um, including China's goals and the means that are being used to carry out that strategy? Sure, thanks. So. I think, you know, what's important is first to think of the Digital Silk Road perhaps as less of a distinct policy on its own and more of an umbrella concept um, that China has used to weave together a number of digital related policy priorities, particularly to streamline those under the Belt and Road Initiative, but also in, in other places. Um, and this has involved from propping up national industry towards China's aim of becoming a self-sufficient world leader in technology or global standards setter. Uh, this synonymous association of national tech champions with the survival of the Communist Party through systematic party capture of erstwhile sort of private uh, enterprise and private tech companies, or the expansion of China's influence around the world by providing the needed digital development services and expertise which is sort of a convenient mask for spreading China's model of digital authoritarianism. And so by providing the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure through the things you mentioned, like 5G, fiber optic, but also the policies, sort of quote unquote, best practices for how to govern said infrastructure, Beijing has been seeking to position sort of a, a China-centric global alternative to the rights-based approach based on, say, human rights, internet freedom principles, towards a model of digital governance where would-be authoritarian regimes might prosper. So, And the Digital Silk Road, it's worth also highlighting that, as with a number of other partnership agreements that China has entered into around the world, such as those on law enforcement cooperation, MOUs and the partnerships along the Digital Silk Road are often opaque. Uh, there's very little transparency, civil society, uh, others fail to understand what is really in a lot of these agreements. They're opaque by design. And this precludes uh, robust, independent human rights impact assessments. And it prevents us often from really being able to understand and to dispel a lot of the inherent, very serious human rights concerns that come along with what appear to be partnerships in line with, again, promoting Beijing's model of uh, very... Uh, sort of authoritarian model of digital governance. Mm -hmm. Now your report examines the digital Silk Road in four specific countries, uh, Cambodia, Malaysia, Nepal, and Thailand. So how did you choose those four as your case studies? Sure, so we wanted to try and have something that was a bit representative. So we moved around the region and the reason that we're uh, beginning with the Indo-Pacific is throughout the last decade really of uh, party uh, pronouncements, declarations, the last couple of five-year plans, a number of documents. Constantly, China prioritizes the Indo-Pacific region as really a, a regional priority. It's its backyard. So a lot of the early adopters, some of the first countries to sign on to uh, Digital Silk Road related uh, partnerships, Pakistan and Thailand and Cambodia, for example, but also we look across the region, the Indo-Pacific, six out of 10 of the countries around the world that are most impacted negatively by China's uh, influence in the Taiwan-based Double Think Labs China Index, but also the region in, in Article 19's Global Expression Report sees a really alarming backtracking in digital rights, but all forms of freedom of expression. We chose four countries, two of them really in crisis, and two of them sort of on the cusp, partly free, as some indicators might say. And we wanted to make sure that we looked at countries, say, both in Southeast and, and South Asia. 
So now let's get to the million dollar question. Um, you spoke earlier about China's goal is trying to get buy-in to its own model of digital governance, um, which unfortunately is quite repressive in terms of freedom of information. So to what extent uh, did your report find that governments in these four countries are actually adopting policies similar to what China has adopted? Sure. So unfortunately, what we've seen is that as China has stepped in to provide needed support for digital development to expand connectivity uh, you know, around these uh, countries and anyone reaching um, you know, peripheries outside of the major cities, um, going along with developing that digital infrastructure and expanding that connectivity is also an adoption of a China style of digital governance. So models that are often more focused on maximizing or totalizing state control than they are ensuring a free, open, interoperable internet, ensuring human rights online or transparency by design. And what we've seen across the region, for example, a few, uh, a few examples, we've seen an alarming embrace of the you know, China-style firewall. In Cambodia, a few years ago, a sub decree on the establishment of a national internet gateway was passed despite considerable concern and critique, both from Cambodian civil society, regional human rights, and the independent experts of the Human Rights Council. And now, while the implementation of the national internet gateway in Cambodia has stalled, it's stalled mostly due to a lack of technical capacity. The political will is there, but Cambodia has not yet to adopt the level of technical infrastructure capacity to follow through on that, which is something that China now is also helping them to build out. So higher bandwidth with some new fiber optic systems and you know much more uh, advanced data centers, for example. Also, we've seen just uh, last year, Nepal in a new national cybersecurity policy has also now begun um, considering the establishment of its own national uh, internet gateway or government-run intranet. Now, while this is only in a policy, it's not enforced in law yet, and there's still a lot of questions around what that might look like, it is unfortunately part of this regional trend of adopting these types of localizing digital sovereignty-based approaches where the government controls all network traffic coming and going, which would supercharge censorship and surveillance capabilities. Thailand also twice since 2015 under the Ministry of Digital Economy and Society has also flirted with similar adoption of China style firewalls. And these are just some examples where we see a trend across the region fueled by a lot of these partnerships, China building out some of the infrastructure to make it possible and promoting laws and policies or regulations on how to govern that infrastructure or how to really you know, digitize governance. And unfortunately, that's often based, again, on maximizing control. And one other thing that we've seen as the Digital Silk Road is very much part of developing China's domestic economy and its domestic national tech champions, as much as it is about you know, global development, we've also seen that through a lot of the Digital Silk Road partnerships in the region, the same companies who have been sanctioned in the West or who have been identified as having uh, complicity in fueling the atrocities committed against Uyghurs and Tibetans in China through things like uh, automating um, uh, surveillance, uh, facial recognition, artificial intelligence services from SenseTime, MegV, or E2, for example, have also been entering into partnerships in a number of the countries uh, around the Indo-Pacific. Again, while some of these haven't necessarily rolled out fully in implementation, it does indicate acceptance from the governments and from a number of the other tech actors in these countries embracing, again, this type of sort of techno-authoritarian approach to governance. Has there been pushback from civil society within these countries? Um, and what could other organizations potentially externally, um, whether that's NGOs, um, groups like Article 19, or even governments that want to support a free internet do to help boost voices in Nepal, Cambodia, Malaysia, Thailand, and elsewhere who are calling for a free and open internet? Sure, there's definitely been pushback. Uh, unfortunately, 
in a number of these countries, that pushback has been met by reprisal, uh, you know, harassment, uh, arbitrary detention in some cases, um, you know, and not to say that, you know, this one set of grievances is unique to that. Unfortunately, this is a region where the right to free expression, assembly, association, and so forth are really, uh, you know, under, under fire. And so despite that, um, you know, I think it's really uh, inspiring that we've seen in a number of cases, you know, really mass um, sort of mobilization against these types of embrace of authoritarian or, you know, digital authoritarian tactics. Um, while we didn't go into Vietnam as much in the report, I think it's worth noting that a few years ago as Vietnam was debating the passage of its own cybersecurity law, which very closely resembled China's, there was massive protests across the country. Some of the largest, in fact, in decades where people were explicitly making the connection between China's cybersecurity law and fears that this would impose similar restrictions in Vietnam. And unfortunately, since then, the, the sort of digital rights situation in Vietnam has, has really severely uh, nosedived. Um, you know, in the report, we go through a number of, I think, very detailed recommendations for uh, governments in the region, uh, you know, the global uh, freedom online, uh, um, you know, uh, stakeholders, uh, private tech companies, and others. So I really encourage people to go to the report to take a you know, much more granular and nuanced sort of take on some of these recommendations. But, you know, top line is really what we need to see is much more embrace of international digital infrastructure and human rights standards. And some of this boils down to we need greater transparency. We need transparency by design in the procurement, the design, the development uh, at every stage in rolling out infrastructure. We need to have independent human rights impact assessment. This is actually, you know, an obligation that states have to ensure that there is, you know, robust human rights due diligence in, you know, a range of development uh, cooperation. Obviously, this is even more important when it's talking about partnerships with China or Chinese companies, but tech companies, including Western tech companies who themselves sometimes are entering into partnerships with Chinese tech companies in these countries, whether that's through cooperation on developing out fiber optic uh, under sea cables or some other partnerships, or just in general, as they're operating in these landscapes, also, have a corporate responsibility under the UN Human Rights, uh, sorry, the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights to conduct, again, robust independent human rights impact assessments. And I think what we need to see is much more of this. We also need to see more resources being made available as the need for connectivity and digital development is not going away. Failing to provide resources from a human rights perspective, where transparency is by design, and supporting creative, positive alternatives for digital development only means that China will continue to fill a vacuum of a needed service and a need to increase connectivity around the world. And until we uh, you know, make more resources available, unfortunately, it will be much harder to push back the you know gl growing influence that China will have through Digital Silk Road sort of development cooperation. Well, thank you very much, Michael, um, for discussing with us the impact of the Digital Silk Road on human rights. Um, anyone interested in reading the full report, uh, you can click the link down below in the comments. And I hope you also subscribe to get more videos like this in the future. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. Thank you for everyone at home for tuning in. And I'll see you next time on Behind the News.